Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about solar and from the perspective of actually using it to building applications, what it can do, what you might use it for, what use cases it does well. Um, not so much about how you configure it, install it, scale it, that kind of operational stuff, um, which is a whole different talk. So I'm going to start off by talking about the Lucene library, which is actually underpinning Solar and Elasticsearch, because um, it does a lot of the heavy lifting. It does most of the, uh, the sort of calculations and things inside Solar. Uh, and actually, it's useful, very useful even on its own. So it's worth going through that as a basis. Um, and then I'll talk about what Solar is on top of uh, Lucene and Elasticsearch a little bit. Slight disclaimer. I've used Lucene for about eight or nine years. I've used Solar for about five or six. I haven't used Elasticsearch personally. Bramwatch does use it. Um, so my opinion of it is going to be very limited um, from what I've read of the documentation comparing it to Solar. It's really all I know. But it is relevant to talk about it. Um, and then I'm going to kind of go on to talk about specific use cases for using any of these tools, really. Um, and then at the end, I've kind of got a Java example about how you could do something fairly useful, fairly simply in uh, using Lucene um, in your own applications without needing anything like Solar actually running separately. <clears throat> so Lucene, it's an Apache open source project. It's in Java. Um, I think it's been ported to .NET, but I don't know how active that's being developed anymore. But it's a search index library. so. And it's probably one of the most popular libraries for doing this kind of work. Um, anyone that's doing any kind of open source work is almost certainly going to be using Lucene for their full text index. If you're building any kind of search index or doing things with text analysis um, and searching. Um, I know that I'm pretty sure that Twitter use Lucene directly for their search indexes. I um, Certainly Yahoo and LinkedIn and people like that use it a lot as well. Um, don't know what Facebook and Google do. It's almost certainly not going to be Lucene. Um, so this is really what's underpinning Solar and Elasticsearch. It's what actually provides the ability to, to create indexes, put documents in them, and find them again. Um, so even though Solar and Elasticsearch are quite common ways to use uh, Lucene, you can just use it directly as a library in your, in your Java applications. And you can do quite a lot of useful things just at that, at that level um, without having the complexity of installing Solar, which is a, a standalone service. Um, so the kind of the core of what Lucene is for is to create an index, um, add documents to it, whatever those documents may be for your application, um, and then run search queries to find subsets of those documents again. And those search queries can get pretty complex. Um, certainly a lot more complicated than you would probably type into to Google. Um, and that's you know, really useful for a lot of use cases with quite sort of power users who know exactly what they want to do and they're very specific about their searches. Um, it's not very, um, it's, it's, Lucene's pretty agnostic about what your documents are. It's up to you to decide what the fields are and, um, and how you deal with the text. So, what Lucene's really best at, and what it was originally designed for, um, is to just find that set of matching documents for your search. And that's really what it's, it's best at. Um, it's, it, its data structures are really built around being able to quickly find however many documents match your query accurately. So, I mean, it, in Brandwatch's indexes, you know, we have billions of documents, and some searches might find millions of hits, but this is, you know, it's in the milliseconds. Um, and certainly for finding smaller hits over smaller indexes, you know, you're talking just a few milliseconds. It's, it's that kind of speed. Um, it's not doing any kind of like full scan of a table and going through um, that slow. Um, and then the other kind of key thing that Lucene provides uh, to you is to, to rank the results. Um, because uh, for a lot of use cases, you really want to say, OK, I've got all these hits, but show me the really interesting ones. Show me the most relevant ones, whatever that means. Um, so that's the other kind of main feature of what Lucene does. Okay. Um, 
you kind of look in, I mean, it's open source. If you look in uh, the API or even the source code, it's, it's quite nicely abstracted, Lucene. It, it, they've separated out the packages reasonably well. Um, so you've kind of got these fairly obvious um, domain object classes for a document. A document contains fields. Um, if you've worked with a kind of document storage um, databases like Mongo and things, it should be fairly familiar as well. Um, so you can add fields, which will be just like a name and a value, um, and then you put them into an index. Um, <clears throat> so Lucene itself doesn't really mind what fields you use and whether you're consistent about it. So if you create a document with two or three fields and then you create another document with completely different fields, you can put those into the index. Lucene doesn't really stop you. It's up to you to decide how consistent you want to be, which, you know, like all schema list things, that's kind of a blessing and a curse, really. Um, so um, you can just store simple values like strings and numbers and things in, in Lucene as fields um, if you just want to fetch those back out again. You can search by them as well. So that's useful for things like kind of authors and dates and uh, language codes, things like that, that are just kind of just values. Um, where it gets a bit more interesting is text fields as a, as a, a sort of field type, um, where this is your kind of full text, really, is um, how do you want to divide that text up? Um, so given a, a long string of text or, or the content of a tweet or a book or a chapter or something like that is, what do you want to do with that text? Because that's what actually gets put into the index. That's what you look for later on. So it's really important how you decide to do that. Um, another great thing about the Lucene library is it's very open. You can um, extend a lot of the classes. You can put plugins in. Um, it's really written with the expectation that you configure it quite a lot. I mean, that, that kind of makes it a little bit intimidating sometimes, is you've, you've got to kind of provide all this configuration. But uh, once you get used to it, um, you really appreciate that. So that's the kind of logical layer of of what Lucene uh, gives you. So as I said, it, you're almost certainly going to want to really control how you turn your text into these kind of tokens, the individual sort of words um, that are going to get indexed. So given a sort of a block of text, a bit like the one at the bottom there, um, how do you want to break that up into words? What, what is a word in your, um, in your text? And then once you've divided them up into, into sort of word blocks, do you want to kind of transform them, normalize them in some way? Um, do you want to then maybe strip some of them out um, or, or sort of find alternatives, things like that? So this is an example of how the brand watch um, is being configured is we don't care about ca um, uppercase, lowercase. So we, so we um, uh, divide Sorry, I'll go back to the, yeah, we, so we divide basically on any kind of punctuation or spaces. So that sort of slash between Nestle and Coca-Cola is, is just effectively considered as white space. But you don't have to do it that way. But for us, that makes more sense because people might want to search for Nestle. They won't necessarily want to consider what, what surrounds it. Um, that, this kind of gets complicated if you're doing things like Chinese and Japanese that don't have white space as a word separators. There's a whole area of Lucene that helps you with that. Um, and then, yeah, we kind of normalize things. Uh, we take out the accented characters because some people say Nestle with an accent, some don't. Um, our clients generally don't want to be that fussy about it. Um, and then maybe you want to take out stop words. Indexing every occurrence of a, uh, a, and the gets a bit expensive. Maybe it's important for your use case. Maybe it isn't. Um, and then you can sort of transform the words a little bit. You might want to say that actually I don't care if there's an S on the end. I'm just going to trim that off as a plural to make it more flexible. I mean, if you used to Google, then they are very flexible about what you type and what they actually match. Um, and then the other kind of package in Lucene is um, how you actually search for things. So query is the, is the, is the object um, which is actually run uh, against the index to find results. So you can build those yourself. You can kind of construct it if it makes sense for your application to kind of programmatically build up um, a Boolean search that consists of this sub-search, which is, consists of something else. Um, or you can just use a parser. So you can just take your full text um, query string like that, that example at the bottom, 
uh, and the parser will turn that into a nested Boolean. Um, and it's got some support for kind of things like prefix. That little star on the end of those words means any word that starts with that. Uh, then you can do phrases and that kind of thing. And the other part of Lucene is the kind of the storage layer, which is kept quite separate, which is where is this index actually going to be kept? Um, so there's kind of four main implementations. You can just have it written to disk, um, which is what kind of originally started with. Um, your index is just stored in a directory. Um, it's a bunch of small files and some big files. Um, slight disadvantage of that is uh, your Java app is going to tend to read that stuff into memory and keep it on the heap, which is not great um, if you've got a large index. So mmap is, um, if you're familiar with um, Linux, um, uh, or any operating system that kind of does paging is just keeps it off the heap, keeps it out of Java, uh, and only reads it as it needs it, which, uh, as it needs bits. Um, HDFS, if you're already using Hadoop, um, and your and your primary data, for example, if that's already stored in Hadoop, um, in the in HDFS, you might want to actually index that and actually keep your indexes stored in HDFS as well, using MapReduce or Spark or something, uh, and then you can then read those directly using Lucene. Um, with uh, HDFS support. So that's quite convenient. And then the, the last one, which I'll use again later in the talk for the example, is um, RAM directory, which just keeps it in memory. Obviously, there's no storage uh, long term for that. It's going to disappear as soon as Java stops. But um, if that suits your use case, it's really useful to do that. So that's Lucene. Um, and if that chimes with the uh, with what you're kind of trying to build as an application and whether that might help you. Um, hopefully that's useful. So, as I say, you can just use Lucene directly in your app, um, but that's becoming less common, and I think most people now are attending to kind of just use Solar as, a, as an external service to keep that, um, well, because it makes your indexes sort of shareable by different applications, um, it offloads a lot of the memory that you would need to, to run it in the house. But it's, it, it, I sort of compared it to things like SQLite, which is an embedded database which you might have in your, in your application, which is, is the same kind of situation. It's like keeping it in your app instead of having it in a, an external service or external database. It's the same idea. So what Solar is, is effectively Lucene as a service. It's, it's, a, it's a search server it m manages the kind of building of indexes and the storage of them, and it just exposes a, an HTTP interface that you can call from your apps. Um, so that kind of takes away a lot of the complexity from your app uh, and just provides it through a nice interface. Um, it also allows you to put together several solar servers to serve a very large index, um, and you can cluster them together. Um, and that's something that probably just wouldn't be feasible if you were doing it embedded. Uh, and as I mentioned, taking it into Solar as a server just means that it's not in your app anymore. Um, and the main feature which most people use for Solar is, is the extra functionality beyond this kind of just initial searching, which is um, you can do things like faceting, which is um, sort of effectively aggregation. Um, you can sort of group results and say, well, these ones are all from the same site, so I'm just going to show you a few from each site just to kind of simplify things. Um, Solar now provides sort of streaming APIs as well as the kind of request response. You can subscribe to things and have a stream coming back to you, um, on which they've built an SQL interface for doing kind of sort of streaming aggregations and uh, that kind of thing. Um, and it can do sort of nice, useful things that you'd expect from a search engine, like little summary snippets with highlight all the words in it and show you where the hits are. So that's the kind of functionality you get from using Solar. So the fact that it's served over HTTP means you don't need to be using a Java app anymore. You can, you can use this from, from anything, um, anything that can, can talk over HTTP, really. Um, the wire formats, Solar's quite, again, quite pluggable. You can ask for responses in JSON and XML. Um, there's a Java client library that comes with Solar, which just makes things a whole lot sort of easier. You just use the API. You don't have to sort of worry about HTTP. It does that for you. And it uses its own binary format, which is more efficient than, uh, than using the textual formats. 
Um, but you can go sort of away from Java and just be writing Python scripts and JavaScripts, anything that can, that can make an HTTP request, get a response back and parse it. It's, um, it's all quite well defined. So we use that uh, kind of thing for sort of our monitoring, for example, is that we, the monitoring scripts will just be in Python. Um, and they can just check the health of solar and do kind of test searches and see that everything's healthy. And that's the kind of example request. It's as simple as Q equals colo, that's my search. I'm going to filter that search by using one of the fields in the documents to say it's only English language. Um, I want 20 results, and I want them to come back as JSON. Um, so it's, it's relatively simple for kind of searches like this. Um, the SolarJ library gives you a lot more sort of power to, to create more complicated searches and hides all this for you. So Elasticsearch, as I said, I don't know it so well, but um, it came along a few years after Solar, um, and it addressed an issue which Solar didn't really do very well at the time, which was to deal with um, looking after... Solar had the facility to do distributed searches. You could send a search to one Solar server and say, and also talk to these other ones to provide me all the results and aggregate them and send them back, which was great for being able to do a really complicated search over a large index. You can just fan it out. But it didn't really help you very much with looking after those machines uh, and splitting up your index and um, just sort of dealing with replication and stuff. And Elasticsearch came along and said, we're going to do this really well. We're going to take something that Solo doesn't do and improve upon it. Um, since then, that kind of competition has, has made Solar um, sort of up their game, really. Um, and now it provides a lot better support for that kind of thing. Um, and then Solar's added new features like the HDFS support, which actually Elasticsearch doesn't provide and that kind of thing. So, I mean, for us, we were using Solar back in the days when Elasticsearch didn't exist, so we picked it and we used it, and we're used to it now. Um, we do use Elasticsearch. Luke's probably the person to ask about that as well. Um, if you haven't used either of them, feature-wise, they're pretty common, uh, pretty similar, really. I would probably just try them and see whichever one feels good to you in terms of setting it up and using it. Um, I don't think there's many killer features that you can do in one that you can't in the other. Um, and Logstash and the kind of elk stack of, of logging has made Elasticsearch become a lot more popular now, which meets people that are used to it and administering it, and they think, well, actually, I can you know, use that for applications as well as just logging. Um, so, yeah, Logstash, is, if, if you kind of look at the trends on Google for popularity of Solar and Elasticsearch, it's definitely... Elasticsearch has taken off in the last couple of years for that reason, I think. So, yeah, so use cases is really what I really want to talk about, is just what can you do with this stuff? So the original, where Lucene came from, and, then, and ultimately Solar, was this kind of classic, just give me the top results for a search, um, which is what Google did and what people expected, and they now want that for their website. Um, so that was the original use case, and it still shows itself in the way that Lucene is designed. Is, is It's really about finding the matching documents, ranking them, and then showing you the top ones. Um, so, and the other, th the other thing that it can tell you pretty quickly is how many hits you had, which, interestingly, Google really just doesn't care about that. Um, the total number of results for Google is, is they've traded off accuracy for, for, for speed, really, um, whereas Lucene will give you that number accurately. It'll t maybe that means it takes longer to do a, a really complicated search, but um, for most people, that's probably what you would want. And I'll come back to the kind of like the counting aspect of it in a bit. Um, typically, the, the the ranking of the documents is based on the kind of um, um, sort of relevance to your search, really, which is quite a well-established field of um, information technology ab about um, working out relevance um, based on searches and documents, that kind of thing. You can set it to other things in Lucene. You can say, I want to sort by any of my fields, which for your use case, you might say, well, I'm actually interested in new documents, so actually sort by date or give me everything that's recent, um, in which case the whole kind of ranking thing is, is, is different again. But 
that isn't really all you can do. And, and even though that's kind of most commonly what people use solar for, um, I think what, what it moves, it's been moving towards really over the last few years is, is more about the counting of, of hits. So, you know, if you used Amazon, you're going to be very familiar with this, is, is that kind of faceting, which is to say, from my search results, give me some subtotals you know, of all those documents that matched, which department breakdown, um, uh, you know, how many were in each department, and what kind of um, manufacturer, and any kind of um, extra fields that you've got in the documents, give me kind of some summary of, of what's going on with that. And then allows you to then click on that, and, and you click through, and it, it applies the filter for that particular category. So that's kind of a very really intuitive way of drilling down into the data. Um, so you would use that for things like the kind of other fields, the non-text fields, like you know, categories or um, authors or um, language, that kind of thing. Um, you wouldn't want to facet on the text itself. You're just going to get like a, a list of the most common words, which is going to be, um, might be interesting, but typically it's going to be quite boring. Um, so how does Solar do this? <clears throat> It, because it's running through all the results anyway, Lucina's collected all the results as it's going through them anyway to, uh, to rank them. It can look up the values of this particular uh, field that you're interested in faceting uh, for each of the documents and then just kind of bucket those up and say, well, okay, I got one for, for France. Okay, it's plus one for that. And then just so on and so on. Um, so that adds a little bit of overhead to the time because it's got to do these lookups. But um, if you've got the right data structures in place in Lucene, to kind of give you that sort of mapping from documents to values of fields and from sort of terms to documents, it's actually surprisingly quick um, because it gives you that as well as giving you the, the ranked results and the total. Um, effectively, it's just doing like that total count, but just for sub queries. Um, so as well as doing it by a particular field and saying, okay, for, for the date field or for the author field, give me, you know, who are the, the top 10 most popular authors amongst results is, you could just send it another search and say, okay, I've got this search, but um, what about how many of those results also match this search as well? Um, it's just as efficient to do that. So this is quite a powerful bit of functionality, really. And it's kind of moving into just general analytics is because it's Lucene is really built around just kind of quickly matching and giving you counts for documents and searches. Um, why not just do that only uh, and not so much worry about the actual results? Um, just give me those breakdowns because there's an awful lot of analytics out there which is just effectively aggregating by one or two dimensions uh, and showing you some, a, a table or you can render it as a pie chart or a, a graph or something. Um, like even just a trend is effectively just an aggregation by day. And if you've got that field, then, then your job's done. So this is, you know, if you're familiar with SQL, this is just grouping by a particular field. Um, and you can nest them as well. So for each of the facets that you're going to compute, you can then say for all of those, how does that break down again? Um, and then for each of those buckets that it's created for every combination, um, either just give me the count or sort of compute some kind of function over those. Um, and really, you, uh, if you're going to do this a lot, you can just say, well, actually, don't, don't give me any results. I, I, just, I don't want any results. I just want the, um, the facets. So what that gives you, and it, it, if anyone's used BrownWatch, that <laughs> actually covers quite a lot of what, what we do. And that just points you towards you know, everyone's favorite dashboard of analytics is pretty much everything on there will just be a, uh, an aggregation by one or two fields uh, rendered in some different visualization, but it's, it's quite simple to compute that. Uh, and because you can kind of ask Solar to do, some facet do a bunch of different facets of the same search, you get all of that in one hit. Um, doing that in SQL without kind of doing multiple scans and aggregations might be quite tricky, but it's, it's easier to build this up um, with Solar facets. Um, so that's actually just what Logstash gives you, and that's why I think Logstash is really kind of popularized this way of, of using Solar and, um, and Lucene just for aggregations. So another thing you can use um, Lucene for, and it's exposed by Solar and Elasticsearch, is, is to kind of make use of its, of its term, term dictionary, because at the heart of 
what Lucene is, is it's really um, it's a dictionary um, and it maps uh, every term, so it's every word effectively that you've ever found in any documents to some information about it. Uh, and that, that, that's the kind of the core data structure it really uses. Um, and this is sorted. So given a particular prefix, it's very easy for it to just jump straight to that bit of the, of the dictionary uh, and then just kind of scan through all the words that begin with that. Um, and it knows how many documents in the whole index match those terms. Um, so you can just sort by that, factory another aggregation, uh, and use that as the most popular autocomplete suggestions. Because um, th this, this kind of dictionary is also used when you're doing those wildcards, because what you're saying is, I want every single word in the dictionary that begins with Tim, um, however many that expands to. Um, but, I, but I probably only want the most common ones, really, in a lot of cases. So that's, that's quite a useful uh, bit of functionality. And that's provided through Solar. Um, or you could even just do it yourself if you've got a smaller index uh, using Lucene directly. Um, and sort of related to that is sort of spell check suggestions and uh, corrections for words because you can, you can ask this term dictionary for an approximate match um, and sort of like a fuzzy match with uh, is it Levenstein distance, I think, is um, the terms which are most close to the one you've asked for uh, with the fewest number of changes, which is ideal for this kind of thing. And of course, it's based on the corpus of what you've actually got in your index, not some kind of general dictionary. It's these are the words that you've actually got um, in the documents that you're searching. So it's the most relevant stuff. Um, yeah, this one's kind of interesting because Brandwatch has used this quite a bit, is effectively turning the search back to front and saying, instead of um, having one large search index with millions of documents that you run a search against, is uh, which is kind of more of a sort of polling, um, you know, give me the results back for this. If you're sort of building something that's more real-time or subscription-based, is you want to say for every new document that you index, if it matches this search that I'm going to tell you about, then tell me. So you're, you're, you're sort of reversing it, excuse me, um, and effectively doing publish subscribe. You're saying, um, here's a bunch of searches that I'm interested in all the time. Um, tell me when something interesting happens with, with the new document that matches it. Um, so going back to that original um, slide I mentioned about the way that Lucene stores its indexes, um, one of them was, was in, in memory. So you've got this RAM index. So you can very quickly put a single document that you're about to index into this uh, single document um, Lucene index and then run your subscribe queries against it. Uh, and just pick the ones that match. It's only going to have a, ever have one match or none. And then that's your kind of your subscription. Um, that facility has always really been there. You can build it yourself. But Elasticsearch popularized that. So Percolator is the feature in Elasticsearch. Solar now has this as part of its... They kind of built a more generalized version of streaming as an API. You can subscribe to searches, and then it just notifies you when they happen. So it's the same idea. Um, Thing to note about that, of course, is that <coughs> if you're subscribing to a load of searches, that's going to slow down your indexing because it happens every time you add a new document. It has to do this work. But if, if the rate of document addition is not too bad, it's probably, probably going to be OK. Um, but it's, yeah, it kind of just turns the idea of what you can do with Lucene around a bit. <coughs> um, yeah, so since this is bright in Java, um, I just want to show you just the amount of code you need to write, really, to, to get something useful done. <clears throat> so the bottom right on the screen is, the, is a sort of word class, uh, phrase cloud um, straight out of Brandwatch. Um, so, so something that we compute on demand as users look for things. Uh, we just show them a, a little graphic like that in one of our components in our app. Um, so to build this, um, we made use of Lucene. Um, to do that on the fly, because uh, the documents that we were building it from actually weren't in Solo, so we couldn't use anything that's, that's like that. Um, so what we wanted is to, um, the way this, this bit of functionality worked is that it would fetch a bunch of documents from the database or wherever they came from with their full text, um, put them into some magic topic extraction thing that will, that will give you back a bunch of uh, phrases that are common in all that text, 
But then the, the bit that was sort of needed in the middle was to say, okay, for all of these topics that we've discovered amongst this text, what's the kind of hit rates and how many of the matches and which ones, um, as well as for each of those, wh how many is there per day, so that you can do a little sort of, um, uh, sort of spike chart showing whether that's a, a trending topic, whether it's something that's just sort of always there or whether it's just suddenly happened and, uh, or whether it's sort of fizzled out a bit now. So, and that's really just faceting, isn't it? It's just um, running a search and counting uh, how many there are and, and how, many, how that breaks down by day. So, yeah, so we use Lucene um, and we use the RAM directory for this because we didn't need persistence because this is really done as a client clicks in the app and something happens and this fires off this code and then they get the response and then we're done. Um, and if, if the JVM stops, then they weren't going to get the response anyway. So we don't need persistence for this. So RAM directory was, was ideal. Um, yeah, and a kind of interesting benefit of using Lucene for this is that you can be quite flexible about the matching of that because even if the topic extraction comes back and says boarding passes is an interesting phrase it's, that's being talked about in this sample, there's going to be a lot of variation about whether people use kind of uppercase B or lowercase or maybe the hyphen between boarding and passes. And so the fact that we were using Lucene searches for this means that we could actually make them a little bit flexible and say, actually just sort of match them maybe if the words aren't directly next to each other, but there's a little bit of a gap, a bit more flexibility. Um, so that was a sort of useful benefit of, of using Lucene for this. So here's the code to, to build that index. I mean, I almost literally ripped this out of our source code, um, and just sort of tied it up a little bit. Um, but so you say, I, I, I'm going to use a round directory. Um, I'm not, I don't want persistence. You create your index writer based on that index. And then for each of the samples, um, you build a Lucene document. So, so the bold um, types are the uh, Lucene API, and all the other ones are, are our local code. Um, and then you add a field for each of the, the, the fields that you're interested in, so the full text, and you say, okay, I want this one analyzed, so I want this one to be broken up into the text, uh, into the individual words. Um, but with the day, it, just assume it's just a formatted day as a, as a string. Don't, don't break it up or anything, just store it as is. Um, add that to the index, and then that sample uh, also gets added to the corpus that we're going to generate topics from. Then close the index, because we've, we're done writing to it now. And that's, that's what we need to do for that bit. And then when we come to do the searches, um, so we open that index um, and then build a searcher around it. Again, it's they're the Lucene uh, APIs. Uh, we run our topic extraction, which comes back with a set of topics. Um, we're going to use a query parser, because it just makes things easier. And then for each of the topics, we can just um, run the parser on that phrase, maybe do some little bit of kind of massaging of the, of the phrase to sort of insert some flexibility into it. Um, and then we've got our query. And then <clears throat> the way that Lucene's API works is you run your search and you provide it a callback collector. So it will call back on you with every document that matches. Um, and then just as a side effect, so you do whatever you need to do in your collector. And I've put that on the next slide. And then once you've run all your searches, you're done. So the, the topic collector I've, I've written there is just um, is based on the topic that it's is, is given, and it just puts its results into that. At that point, you're basically done with Lucene, and that was it. So here's the collector callback. Um, uh, so, so you just override this method that says that tells you when you've matched a document, it gives you the ID, that's all it needs. It also gives you the index reader that it's reading from so you can actually look up things. Because you might not need to, you might just be counting, in which case that's what you, you don't need any more context than that. But in this particular case, um, <clears throat> so the first line of the, of the collection is just to say, well, there was a hit for this particular topic. Um, but because I want that extra breakdown by day, I need to actually go off to the index and, and get that document so that I can pull out the field uh, for day, and then I've got that value. So this is just doing what faceting does in Solar, really. It's just, as each document's being processed anyway, it's just pick that bit out of the document, 
um, that field and then increment the matches for that day. So at the end of this process, um, all the topics have been populated. Um, and as I say, that is almost verbatim the kind of amount of code you need to write. It's quite reasonably well-designed kind of API. Um, yeah, so that, that code <coughs> just kind of gave us that facility to, do, uh, to use Lucene for something that wasn't really um, needed in a dependency on Solar or making external calls. It just makes it nice and compact and it's fully embedded. Um, and yeah, so that was it. <laughs>